In the far reaches of the world, under a lost and lonely hill, lies the sinister Tomb of Horrors. This labyrinthine crypt is filled with terrible traps, strange and ferocious monsters, rich in magical treasures, and somewhere within rests the evil Demi-Lich. Hello and welcome to DM It All, a new show where we talk about D&D and other tabletop gaming books. The idea behind the show is that Dungeons & Dragons is already kind of a niche hobby, and most people who do play it haven't read every book, because that might be literally impossible. It's decades worth of material. So we'll be exploring these old books to learn some history and maybe gain some inspiration. Our topic for today is an adventure called Tomb of Horrors. And even though we just said the premise of the show is to discuss obscure books, The Tomb of Horrors is actually a well-known book by the D&D community. But even if people might know the name, they might not know why it's so infamous. So what is the actual plot for this adventure? Well, as the pitch suggests, it's about a tomb filled with treasures. A tomb owned by a Demi-Lich. So if you know D&D or modern fantasy, you might know that the Lich is a spooky scary skeleton mage. But you might not know what a Demi-Lich is. And a Demi-Lich might not be what you expect. But that's the only bit of real intrigue to the plot. What's a Demi-Lich? Otherwise the whole dungeon is just a murder hobo scenario. The party just wants to raid this guy's tomb for treasure and experience points. The fact that he's an evil lich is kind of a technicality, probably so the party doesn't feel too bad for taking his stuff. The book is famous for two reasons that are very connected. One, it was written by Gary Gygax, one of the co-creators of Dungeons & Dragons. And two, it's known as the hardest dungeon in D&D history. The tomb became so famous among D&D players that it got reprints and sequels in almost every edition of D&D. It even got some pop culture permeation through the book Ready Player One. That book essentially uses the tomb for 80s nostalgia, but the module itself dates back even further in D&D history. The tomb was created for the original edition of Dungeons & Dragons from 1974. Gygax and his gaming table had been playtesting the D&D rules for a while, and they were looking for a new type of challenge. And that's what this dungeon is. Gygax intros this book by pitching it as a thinking man's dungeon. He says people who like hacking and slashing will probably not be happy with it. Basically, this is meant to be a slow and methodical dungeon, focused more on traps than fighting. It was something different, and the whole point is to subvert what players would expect to see in a dungeon. The tomb was first shown to the public in 1975 during the Origins 1 Wargaming Convention. That was only a year after D&D was first publicly released, and it helped cement the old school table dynamic. Because of dungeons like this one, Players developed an adversarial relationship with the dungeon masters. The DM was the enemy and he had to kill the players. Meanwhile, the players had to find ways to break the DM's campaign. So if it ever seemed like some dungeons or DMs wanted to kill your character, it's because they actually did. Before we start this dungeon for real, we want to give a spoiler warning. We're not going to cover every room of this dungeon and we're not going to give all the details, but we are going to give away a lot of big twists and turns. If you're a player just looking for an adventure recommendation, you can jump ahead to the time shown here for our final thoughts. Anyway, now we enter spoiler territory, and probably death territory. To start off, it doesn't matter how the party hears about the tomb or who they are. All that matters is that they are dumb enough to seek it out. Then they will find it under a low, flat hill with large rock formations. If the party looks at the hill from above, they'll see an array of objects that look like a skull. At least, it looks like a skull according to the book. Jack-o'-lantern seems to be more accurate to us. To even find the entrance to the tomb, the party has to start digging through the sand that's blocking it, which is a good warning sign for anyone expecting a fast-paced, action-packed adventure. The book recommends the players use a 10-foot pole to break up the sand, probably because a 10-foot pole is a good idea in general. 
characters poking everything with a pole became a cliche back in the old days, mostly because of dungeons like this one. This was way back before modern D&D, and before we had fancy doohickeys we now take for granted. Things like the passive perception checks and reflex saving throws. Here, you usually had a 1 in 6 chance to notice a trap before it killed you. And that was only if you were actively looking for it. Poking the traps with the pole has a 4 in 6 chance of revealing them, which still isn't perfect, but in old school D&D, you took what you could get. It's also important where the party starts digging to, because there are two fake entrances. Both of these entrances feature a long corridor with doors at the end. If the player opens these doors, they'll find nothing but blank walls behind them. The party better get used to this feeling of disappointment, because the fake doors are a trademark of this dungeon. They are scattered throughout the tomb, and a lot of them have traps waiting behind them. Like these do! The trap in the first fake entrance causes the ceiling to collapse on the party. The trap in the other entrance will make the walls close in to trap or crush the party. It depends on how fast they are. If the party survives these two fake entrances, they'll learn the most important lesson in this dungeon. Never open any obvious doors. Always look for the secret doors. The only exception is a door later on that looks like a fake door, but actually has a secret door behind it. And yes, that actually does happen. The actual entrance to this tomb is a long hallway with mosaic decorations on the wall. These decorations depict perfectly normal stuff like a library, an open field, a wizard's workroom, a torture chamber, uh, pig people, and dog people too. Again, totally normal stuff. On the floor of this corridor is a long and winding path of red tile. Also on the floor are many, many spike pit traps. Poisoned spike pit traps, in fact. If that already seems like overkill to you, then you should also know that poison back then was an insta-kill effect. Players do get a saving throw to resist the poison, and thank god for that. Especially because there are very few traps in this dungeon that are generous enough to offer that. Save or die is the best you can expect in this tomb. And no, the red tiles on the ground have nothing to do with these pit traps. It doesn't matter if the party avoids the tiles or walks on them, they'll trigger the traps regardless. These are the instances where the player lives or die by their use of the 10 foot pole. If the party survives long enough to reach the end of the hallway, they'll see this face. If you know the Tomb of Horrors, you'll probably know this face. You might not know what it does, but you might have seen it pop up in random references to this dungeon, or several times in this video. It's basically the logo for the Tomb of Horrors. But back then, no one knew anything about it. All they saw was a goofy green devil face with a giant gaping mouth, and all they could see inside was perfect blackness. Some people stuck their hands into this mouth to feel around, and others tried crawling inside. That's when these players learned that this giant mouth leads directly into a sphere of annihilation. You can probably guess what a sphere of annihilation actually does based on the name. It's a section of the universe where reality just stops existing and anything that touches it also stops existing. Forever, no afterlife, no chance of resurrection, nada. To the left of the devil face is an archway filled with thick magical mist. The stones on the archway will light up with different colors as the party approaches. Touching the stones in the right order will cause the mist to disappear, then the party can use this archway to teleport deeper into the tomb. This is not the only misty archway in the dungeon, but it is the only one that's actually solvable. A common trope with this adventure is lulling players into a false sense of security and then changing the rules on them. For example, there are other green devils in the dungeon, but they teleport characters instead of annihilating them. Nothing in the Tomb of Horrors has the same effect twice. That is true for the archway as well. The other archways in this dungeon teleport the party back to the entrance, but only the party, not their gear. All non-organic matter gets sent to the Demi Lich's treasure chamber, weapons and clothes included. We should note that this dungeon was meant for level 10 characters, so that would be 10 levels worth of treasure that the party had just donated to the tomb. That also means you're naked, so it's going to be even harder to get that treasure back. We should also note that one of the archways also gender swaps the characters for no apparent reason. The Demi Lich has a sense of humor, I guess? So going through misty archways is a bad habit to pick up, but the party doesn't seem to have many other options in the first hallway. So how is the party really supposed to make progress? Well, the best way to do that is just to stare at the floor. Literally, staring at the floor long enough will reveal the red tiles to be runes with a hidden message. Did we already mention that this is a very slow and methodical dungeon? Anyways, these runes spell out a message from the Demi-Lich of this tomb. His name is Asirarak, and he leaves messages like this one to mock the party. 
I know, shocker of the year, the owner of this tomb is a massive troll. But the messages he leaves in the entrance are actually very important. This is basically the hint section for the entire adventure. Each line refers to a different puzzle or trap in the dungeon. If the party is smart, they'll write this down for later reference. The tormentor mentioned in the first line is painted on the mosaic wall. The party will have to chip away at the plaster to reveal a secret door behind it. The tormentor himself is a caged monster the Asirarak apparently used to torture his prisoners. It's kind of pointless to even mention this thing because nothing from the mosaic art shows up in this dungeon. You might think it's for realism purposes. It would be stupid to bury creatures alive in an underground tomb. Except there's a creature in the very next area. Here, the party gets attacked by a mutant four-armed gargoyle wearing a ten-gem necklace. It's not really clear why this creature is here, or why he's looking so glamorous. Well, at least not on a practical level. On a puzzle design level, it's kind of well done. Later on, the party will find a four-armed gargoyle statue that looks similar to this living gargoyle. The statue smashes any gems the player gives it, so at first this puzzle might just seem like a dick way for the DM to rob players of their treasure. But if the party remembers the living gargoyle's necklace and hand over all ten gems, the statue will reveal a gem of true seeing. True seeing lets the party see through illusions and secret doors, so getting this is basically mandatory. After the gargoyle fight, the player will reach another long mosaic hallway. The art on these walls depict figures holding different color spheres. Eventually, the party should realize that some of these spheres are illusions. These illusions cover up crawlways to other areas, like a nearby secret treasure room. Well, calling it a treasure room is kind of inaccurate. It has three chests in it, but only one of them has treasure, and all three of them have traps. The party is supposed to find a crawlway behind the black mosaic sphere to progress. Well, to have a chance to progress. The crawlway behind the black sphere is a dead end, but it has a secret door inside of it. The odds of finding it are 1 in 6, so it's more likely that the party will be wandering in circles for a while. That might seem like a BS dungeon design, but you're assuming that the party is actually supposed to finish this dungeon. <laughs> One piece of evidence to show that this is not the case is the next secret door. It is located at the bottom of a spiked pit trap. Another poisoned spiked pit trap. You know, the thing your party was avoiding until now? To be fair, this is actually the fortuitous fall mentioned in Asirarak's message. But the party better hope they're clever enough to make this connection. You see, the only visible area past the spike pit is a hallway built on a counterweight beam. Basically, the floor here is kind of like a seesaw. The further the player goes down the corridor, the more it starts to tilt in the direction they're walking. Eventually, the floor will tilt so much that the party will slide down the hallway. Then they will learn that there is a magma pit waiting for them at the other end. But if the party can find the secret door at the bottom of the spike pit trap, <clears throat> poison spike pit trap, they will be rewarded by having some more secret doors and having to deal with more of this BS. The next secret door is hidden in a room filled with fear gas that makes characters flee in terror. But after all that comes the real reward, because the party will discover Asirarak's crypt. That's right, the party will be in the final area. Asirarak will rise from his gold couch in the middle of a rotting room to challenge the party. A silver glowing mace is located in this room, and it is the key to defeating him. Three hits with it, and Asirarak withers away to nothing. Then the room will begin to shake, and the party must flee before the room collapses. If the party gets out in time, the DM is recommended to close the book and say, Hope it wasn't too hard of a dungeon, guys! <laughs> the inside joke is that this whole boss fight uh, was a fake. Everything. This quote-unquote Asirarak was just a zombie dressed up to look like a lich. You see, the real Asirarak knows what doofy adventurers would expect in a boss fight and set up this little stage show around those ideas. And if the party accepts this ending, the DM is supposed to let them. To make it extra funny, this is the fight depicted on the cover of the module. Spoilers, demi liches don't look like this. Even the cover is trying to psych the party out. If the party is too clever to fall for this ruse, they will spot another secret door near the fake crypt. This one basically needs the gem of true seeing to notice and magic to unlock. If you remember, even the fake Asirarak fight was hidden behind a secret door. The path forward and even dead ends are getting harder to find. The party will eventually enter a rotted room decorated with tapestries. These tapestries are actually green slime in disguise, which is way less silly than it sounds. Well, it's still a silly premise, but Green Slime is one of the scarier D&D monsters. It's an insta-death trap that turns anything it touches into Green Slime. Anything, including characters. 
Instant death isn't the right term for it, because slimed characters can't even be resurrected. The good news is that green slime can't move, so the party is safe if they don't walk into it. The bad news is that the party will have to walk into it, because it's blocking the doors to the next area. From there, the party have to find another secret door, what a surprise, or risk walking down multiple dead ends. One of these dead ends is a cavern full of idiot gas, and by idiot gas we mean it actually lowers a character's intelligence stat. They literally become an idiot until they leave the tomb. The creator of this idiot gas is a siren from Greek mythology, except sirens in old D&D don't try to lure sailors to their deaths, and are generally quite nice. This siren is a prisoner of a Sidorak, and the party can actually recruit her to join them. That is, if they don't get too greedy. Trying to grab any of the treasure near the siren causes her to disappear. It doesn't mention her again after this point, so we assume she must be dead. Her blood is now on the party's hands. The other major dead end in this area is a hallway that fills with sleeping gas. A Sarak likes his gas traps, apparently, and there is no way to resist this effect. The party will fall asleep, and then the juggernaut will enter the hallway to steamroll over the party. That's actually what he does. A juggernaut is a giant steamroller. This thing just flattens the party into pancakes as they sleep. The juggernaut isn't even a monster with stats or anything the party can fight. The only thing the players can do is hope they get away in time. But to make progress, the party will have to find the pillared throne room. Here, the party will see a crown and scepter sitting on the throne. The scepter will serve as the key for the next few areas. The party just needs to make sure that they're using the correct end of the scepter because it has a silver side on one end and a gold side on the other. Using the wrong end at the wrong time can lead to some pretty bad effects, including, you guessed it, insta-death. And no, there is no obvious way to tell which end is the correct end. It's worth pointing out that the parties back then were usually bigger and were expected to have hirelings, which are basically mercenaries. The best way to handle this scepter is probably to have the hirelings test it out instead, but hirelings are still human beings so the party should be extra careful pushing them into too many dangerous positions. Because in a dungeon like this, they might get a mutiny on their hands. But maybe the player can win back their mercenaries by offering them some of the treasure that's right next door, because the Sararak's treasure room is up ahead. Here, the player will find a coffin with the Sararak's name on it, and a Sararak's withered corpse inside of it. You see, this dungeon subverts the player expectations so much that there is no actual final boss fight. That is totally what's going on. Now the party can just take all the gold coins and leave. Hooray! But if the party pays their henchmen with this treasure, they better prepare for another mutiny. Because this is yet another fake finale to the dungeon. All the gold here is just painted over copper. And the real Acerorak still lurks deeper within the tomb. The party and their goons will have to push one of the giant statues in this room to reveal the actual final area. There, the party will discover that the final treasure room is actually empty, and the party has wasted their time with this dungeon. But of course, this isn't actually empty, and you just have to applaud the sheer number of fake endings to this adventure. Even the actual ending is technically a fake ending if you count the sequel Return to Tube of Horrors. To find the real final area, the party will have to put a key into the center of the floor. Then the actual treasure room will rise up and finally reveal the good stuff. But not only will the party find lots of gold, they will also find a skull covered in priceless gems. If the party is foolish enough to touch the skull, it will come to life and steal the soul of the strongest party member. You see, this skull is actually a Sararak, and this is what Demi Liches look like. Demi Lich isn't a status, it actually means a Lich that is literally Demi. Demi Liches are so beyond the living form that their skull is actually all that remains of their body. The soul of the Lich has left to explore other planes at this point, and only comes back when people hassle its tomb. The skull actually does disengage from combat, after it steals a soul, but at this point it doesn't really matter. If the party is worth a damn, they'll keep fighting just to free their friend. They'll need powerful weapons and spells to even deal any damage to the skull, and a Sararak can insta-kill a party member as a regular action. The odds are not in the party's favor. People defend this boss fight, though, as the adventure once again going against players' expectations. They claim that the party isn't supposed to touch the skull, and that they're just supposed to steal the treasure around it. Which kind of makes sense, except players signed on to fight a demi-lich. Some of them might be role-playing paladins, devout clerics, or even just generally noble warriors who want to stamp out this evil being. They're not going to settle for robbing his house and leaving him alone. Even if the players are just murder hobos who only care about the treasure, the skull has expensive gems all over it, so it's almost guaranteed the party will touch the skull. That makes this probably the most unfair trap in this entire dungeon, 
but it's kind of appropriate to have the final boss be the ultimate BS trap. So is the Tomb of Horrors one of the greatest dungeons of all time? Well, yes, if you look at it in the right context. It is the greatest dungeon for a particular niche. While Gygax did make this dungeon for a home group campaign, that's not the way the public was introduced to it. The Tomb of Horrors was not only one of the first D&D modules, it was also one of the first tournament modules. Conventions like Origins 1 used to feature actual D&D tournaments with prizes for people who finished them. The official dungeon masters at these events had to kill off as many players as possible, so only the best of the best could win. And this tournament legacy is written all over this dungeon, both in its trap design and general philosophy. But this probably isn't a good addition to a long-term campaign. Home games are fun because they are something players get invested in, but tournament modules encourage the opposite attitude. Players at these competitions literally bring stacks of disposable character sheets. They knew their characters were going to die because the whole point was for their characters to die. If you run this dungeon in the same competition style, this dungeon can lead to an enjoyable one-shot adventure. Otherwise, your players will probably feel cheated after losing a character they worked hard on. But how is the Tomb of Horrors as a competition? Well, if you're interested in traps and puzzles, this book is basically made for you. It is a slow dungeon though, and it can be obscure at times. But it probably seems more cryptic on paper than it might be in practice. If your party comes in with a cautious and careful attitude, that will get them half of the way there. It is 100% possible for the party to make it to the end, but victory is not guaranteed and your party needs to know that. But one final question to ask is whether or not this book is worth running in newer editions, and the answer to that is that the Tomb of Horrors can really be used in any system. The point of this dungeon is to challenge the players, not the characters. This was before rules outside of combat were really established. So most of this experience is talking things over with your DM. The simple mechanics and the simple premise help this dungeon's popularity, since you don't need to know D&D to know why this module spooked people. But if you're curious about whether the official 5th edition conversion is any good, the answer to that is no. 5th edition characters are already way more durable than this module expects players to be, but that conversion nerfs the actual dungeon too. Most of the insta-death traps are easier to avoid, and often aren't insta-death traps anymore. You're probably better off with the original version and converting it yourself. At least, if you want the authentic Tomb of Horrors experience. It kind of defeats the point of the death trap dungeon, when the traps make very little death. Thank you all for watching the first episode of DM It All. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments. Is the tomb a good challenge, or is it an unfair meat grinder? How many of you tried to beat the tomb, and what horror stories do you have? If you haven't tried the tomb, would you consider it? Also feel free to suggest other D&D books or topics for us to do in the next video. And while you're at it, please leave us a like and subscribe if you're feeling generous. See you all next session.